have three stone axes. One we know has come from Mount William up in the Grampians. One's come from Mount William near Lara. And the third one we believe has come from somewhere over near Casterton, indicating that the tribes moved fairly frequently and would trade goods and things with uh, the, the other local tribes. What I've got in my in my hand is um, it's a green stone axe. It's pretty common throughout the uh, the Western Districts. Um, it's been uh, used a lot for trade, but more importantly, it's a it's an object that it's um, it's been uh, grinded on each side to form an axe shape. Uh, for cutting uh, certain things. So it was really important in Aboriginal lifestyle, especially through uh, Japaron country. Um, a lot of these objects you'll find around a lot of waterways, also campsites. Here we have a um, grinding stone, which was also used in two facets. One side was for grinding the seeds for your flour and that. And the other side, which was also used for your fire. So the little indent there, they would put the main stick in there for friction, they put bark or whatever, and then in this part they would fill it with extra grass, so the, as you can see the little leverage there so it would go down the channel and then they'd start to blow on it and then they'd start their fire. Here we have a male artefact and it's called a bull roarer. This was mainly used like a telephone. It was swung over the head, they'd have a string, it would be swung over the head and it could be here for miles. So the people like, say, down the road would hear it and they would say, oh, there's a meeting on tonight. Until um, the contact period, most of the tools that were made had no decoration on them at all. Um, they were plain, pure, simple, made to do the job and not to be some sort of showpiece. On my left hand is your normal hunting spear. It was mainly just used for hunting and nothing else. Kangaroos, wallabies, possums, whatever it was about at the time. And this one here was used for your war because of the barbs on it. So when this penetrated into the person, there's only one way it'll go, straight through you. The shield, for example. It's got all this lovely work done to it. But the work's certainly not going to stop the spear from coming at you, you know. The, ang the angle club had two purposes. One was for digging, and the other one was for inflicting pain on your mortal enemy. Now, the way it works is the shield here, as you see, was used for parrying. Okay? So if you could not get around your enemy, you would go for the hand, or if he was across the top like that, you'd come over the top into the head. If he was trying to underneath, you'd come underneath with the angle club. And that was mainly light. The shield was light because you also had your spears with you and your stone axe when you're in war. We're very fortunate to have a message stick because Ramsey didn't understand the tradition of the Aboriginal people in that the message stick should have been burnt in the fire when it arrived. And so we have a traditional message stick that is marked with Bobby's markings. This is what you need to get from one boundary to another into someone else's country. And if you look closely, you'll see the name of the person, in this case, who made it, which is, we know, is Bo old Bobby. Right? And also it is a marking of his mob, his clan, his tribe, as you can likely see. So he would need this to go from the Japaron country to say Gunijimara, or if he wanted to go further on the Bowenlik lands, with the markings on it, the name Old Bobby, he would wait on the boundary and for the neighbouring tribe to come over, then he would pass the message stick on to them. And they would look at the markings on it, they would know who's his clan, what his blood grouping is, his kinship structure, and his name, most of all. So. They knew he was passing through their country and they would return it to him for safe passage so if he went on to the next mob, he would have to show them the same. I'd certainly hope that um, it would evolve to a point where maybe the sharing of collections um, 
so that maybe once we have our centre built that we could exchange with the museums or keeping places? Certainly as an individual, um, uh, as an Aboriginal uh, man, uh, very proud to tell my children and their children to say, listen, uh, be proud who you are and um, if you uh, ever come to a place where um, you see things that belongs to, to our traditional owner group, um, you know, speak up and be proud about it. And I think that's very important. Be proud of who we are and be proud of what we've got and uh, be able to share and pass on because it's part of their history, it's part of their learning.